this man, Ray Bryant, is looking for what he thinks is his own grave. For somewhere in this cemetery lies soldier Reuben Stafford, died 1879. Can Bryant, as he claims, be Stafford reborn? What else can explain the way he relives the dead man's life under hypnosis? Like this moment from the Crimean War. <laughs> Half to sleep, half to sleep, half to sleep. According to the army records, he was wounded in the left hand at that battle. Can Bryant, can we all have lived before? Mysteries from the files of Arthur C. Clarke, scientist, writer and visionary. The scientist who invented the communications satellite, the writer of 2010, and now in retreat in Sri Lanka, the visionary who ponders the riddles of this and other worlds. This is the editorial office of The Sun, one of Sri Lanka's most popular newspapers. The journalists behind me are writing up tomorrow's edition. Stories of politics, sports, human interest, the kind of material that sells newspapers all over the world. But there's one kind of story that The Sun thrives on, that you'll hardly ever see in the Western press. And there are bulging files on it here. These are stories of reincarnation. They tell of young children who often, as soon as they can speak, talk about their real parents and their other homes. They seem to recall previous lives, often in such detail that they not only provide good copy for local journalists, but they persuade researchers all over the world that there's a phenomenon here worth investigating. Here's a story of a little boy, Ajit, who remembers drowning five years ago. And here is a story about a little five-year-old girl who thinks she's a man who was killed in a road accident. But the story which most fascinates me is one that comes from the place I love most in Sri Lanka, the beautiful little bay of Unawatuna on the shores of the Indian Ocean. The story is a tragic reminder of Sri Lanka's brief but bloody insurrection of 1971. A captured rebel, a young man named Robert, leapt to his death at the sea. His close companion, Johnny, had already been killed. These twin girls were not born until seven years later. Yet almost as soon as they could speak, they claimed to be reincarnations of Johnny and Robert. Shiromi recounts gruesome details of Johnny's death. Shivanti says she remembers leaping into the sea with the wrists wired together. Such stories are intriguing, but for them to be accepted as evidence of reincarnation, every detail must be checked by a trusted investigator. Journalist Delreen Vigiratni covers many reincarnation stories. The latest comes from a jungle village, Pethiagada. In this case, four-year-old Inoka is the child who claims to have lived before. The story goes that when she first began to talk, Inoka told her mother, Rita Sriyani, that she had another family. They lived in a town called Minuangada. She claimed to remember having two sisters and a brother. They lived in much less primitive surroundings. Their house had running water and electricity. <laughs> Inoka's mother says she'd never believed in reincarnation, and she certainly wasn't going to trek six miles through the jungle to Minawangada to check Inoka's claims. At first, we started ignoring her conversation because we didn't want our only daughter to talk about another family, another father and another mother. But Inoka's grandmother, Kiriyama, did listen to the tales of the little girl and in the end was persuaded to take her to Minawangada. At the Buddhist temple there, the priests were intrigued, a 
but not surprised, for Buddhists believe in reincarnation. They soon discovered that eight years before, an 11-year-old girl called Milani had died in a motorbike accident. She'd had one brother and two sisters, and they'd lived in this modern house. It all fitted in Oka's description. When she was taken there, her first reactions amazed her mother, Rita Sriyani. She was no stranger in that house. And her first question was, where's my doll? She started calling the mother of her previous life, mommy. And Rita Sriani was quite unhappy about it. And she was asking for all the toys of her previous birth. Today, Inoka frequently makes the journey to Minawangada. Milani's father welcomes Inoka as a member of the family. Bandu accepts her as his reborn sister. <laughs> the girls say Inoka knew their names the first time she came to play. And she went straight to this cupboard for the dead girl's suitcase of toys. She identified Milani's photograph as my picture, and she calls Mrs. Godagampala her real mother. And what difference did the Inoka's arrival make to your life? I'm very happy, because I had three or four children, I lost one, and I got her back again. I see no other explanation to this story other than reincarnation. I mean, how can you expect a girl from, uh, from Pettyagoda, that's six miles away, from this spot to talk of a family in Minuangoda that she has never seen or heard before. So you have to accept it as reincarnation and nothing else. So the strange claims Inoka made when she began to speak have brought great happiness to a family that no longer mourns. Stories of this kind are very rare in Britain. One of the most remarkable began in 1957 in Northumberland, in the country town of Hexham. It was there one Sunday morning that tragedy struck John Pollock and his family. His two daughters and a friend were killed by a car on their way to church. Jacqueline was six and Joanna 11 when they died. But John Pollock did not despair while Hexham grieved. He believed that his wife would conceive twins, that the girls would be reborn. From the moment I knew she was pregnant, I believed that the girls would come back. And against all the doctor's predictions, Florence Pollock did produce twin girls. The first thing I noticed when I saw those twins was, we hadn't named them then, but the younger one of the two had a scar coming across her forehead down onto the bridge of her nose, which was the identical scar to that Jacqueline, the younger one of the girls that had been killed, had had when she fell off a little tricycle when she was about two years old. Also, I, mean, I didn't see it at the time, but later, my wife said to me, it's an incredible thing, but she's also got the birthmark on her left hip that Jacqueline had. Jacqueline had a birthmark on her left hip, which was like a brown thumbprint. To this day, Jennifer still has that brown birthmark. Mrs. Pollock was astonished when she gave the twins the dead girls' dolls. When I got these two <coughs> dolls out, one said, oh, that's Mary and that's Susan. And it was exactly the same names as my other daughters had named them. And that was the sort of really turning point in my way of thinking. The family had moved away after the tragedy. But on their first visit to Hexham, the twins seemed to remember the landmarks. Well, when we came at the top of Battle Hill, they came over the brow, approaching St Mary's Church, which they couldn't see. One turned to the other and said, well, the school's up round here, which we used to go to, and the playground's round the back. Now, they couldn't possibly have seen any sign of a school or a church even. 
I mean, they were so small, they couldn't even have seen over the wall. And uh, sure enough, I mean, the school is around the corner. And this was the most incredible thing. And we continued to walk on. I mean, we were absolutely amazed at this. And as we came past the church, on the opposite side of the road is Hexham Abbey and the Abbey grounds. And um, one tenant said, oh, the playground's over there. And she was right. The playground was over there, but they couldn't see it from where they were standing because the brow of the hill was in the way. So convinced were the Pollocks that their daughters had been reborn that even the children's grave no longer held any sorrow for them. There's a grave there, but it means nothing. To me, to bring flowers or anything on the grave would be sheer hypocrisy because I don't believe that they're here. I mean, it's just a symbol of two girls that lived that were reborn. Such accounts of rebirth are rare in the West, where the most fruitful source of material is hypnotic regression. It was hypnotic regression that convinced Ray Bryant that he had lived before as Colour Sergeant Reuben Stafford, who fought in the Crimea and who's buried in this cemetery. Bryant hopes to find the truth in Preston. Fullwood Barracks is the headquarters of Stafford's regiment, the 47th Lancashire Regiment of Foot. Under hypnosis, Ray seems to remember living as Stafford and many of his memories check out. There was such a person as Colour Sergeant Reuben Stafford of the 47th Lancashire Regiment of Foot. He did actually exist. Uh, we began to find army records which proved it. We found his death certificate. Stafford drowned in London in 1879, but 25 years earlier he fought in the Crimean War. In the regimental safe are dozens of letters crammed with details of the Crimean campaign. As far as anyone knows, they've never been published, so Bryant cannot have seen them. Colonel John Bird hopes to check Bryant's apparent memories against the facts in these letters. They were written by Major Richard Farron, second in command of the regiment. Every week he described to his mother the agonies of the Crimea. If I do remember what is in those letters, we still can't say that it really proves anything. We can't say that it's reincarnation. We can't say that it's inherited memory. We can't say that it's telepathy. We, we can't really say what it is, but at least it shows that something is there and it is not all imagination. In the regimental museum, Bryant will be hypnotized and taken back in time for Colonel Bird's interrogation. Until he goes under, he's blindfolded so that he cannot pick up any clues from the museum's treasures. Before long, Bryant is unconscious and ready for regression. First, hypnotist Joe Keaton takes him back through his own life. Everything you tell us must be things that have actually happened to you personally. Nothing you've read, nothing you've watched, nothing you've been told. It's Christmas Day today and you're three years old. It's Christmas Day today and you're three. Hello, Ray. How are you? <laughs> what are you doing? What are you doing? And Looking at the tree. <laughs> what tree? <laughs> tree? Is there anything there for you? <laughs> what is there? It's a parcel. Oh, do you know what's in it? <laughs> I don't know. Who brought it? Um, I... But even more remarkably, it seems he can be regressed to before he was born. I'll go back further still. Go back further still. I want you to go back to the year 1855. It is the year 1855. In 1855, the 47th faced a bitter Crimean winter. Under hypnosis, Bryant seems to re-experience every hardship suffered by the ill-equipped infantry. And his accent has changed. Oh, bloody cramp. Why have you got cramp? Because it's bloody cold. Very convincing, 
But can he recall simple details like the names of the men in command? Can you give me the names of any of your officers? Lowndes, Captain Lowndes. There's company commander. Mm. Lieutenant Irvin. It's a second in command. And who was commanding the 47th? Colonel Villiers. Colonel Villiers? Uh, I see. Sadly, he was only partly right. The army list for that year shows that there was a Captain Lowndes, but no Lieutenant Irvin. There were two captains called Villiers, but no colonel. In command of the 47th was Colonel William O'Grady Haley. And curiously, he's wrong about something Stafford must have known. You carry a rifle. What sort of rifle? Uh, Hammond. Hammond? Hmm. A Hammond rifle? In fact, the regiment had just been issued with Minier rifles. There was a Hammond rifle, but the army didn't even test it until more than 10 years later. But his description of a drum captured from the Russians was uncannily close. Did you capture any drums? Uh, hmm? Uh, Have you seen them? Side drums. Side drums, were they? Uh, what were they like? Like our own? A uh, gold or uh, brassy sort of uh, ornament on them. It's like avant churches. I saw uh, uh, animal led. Now it's the 20th of September, 1854. Now, what's going on around you? What are you doing? We're encamped on Els above the Alma. Above the Alma? Aye. What's the Alma? Alma is... Alma River. And which... Where is the Alma from where you are at this very moment? Uh, it's down below to... Below. The Alma River was the scene of one of the most ferocious battles of the Crimean War. Bryant's description of crossing the river is so vivid, it's hard to believe he isn't there. Major Farron wrote home, the heavy guns of the enemy were placed on the high ground beyond the river, and the moment we came within range, he fired away round shot, grape, and shells, which rattled like a storm of hailstones. You're crossing the armor with your regiment. What's going on? We're coming on under fire. From where? From hills. Where are the hills? Hurry up, hurry up. Hills up front. Rest, rest, go to sleep. Go to sleep. What was it like crossing the river? It was horrible. There were a lot of, a lot of shrapnel all about. What was the crossing like? Was it deep? Uh, waist. Well, up uh, above waist. And, and, Oh, bloody oh. What's the ground like on your way up the hill at the other side, where it's you are now? Sand and, sand and mud. I mean, it can't get the grip hardly. Farron wrote, the river is a difficult one for troops to ford under fire. The banks were steep and precipitous and slippery with mud. Bryant's exactly right about the mud. It's an extraordinary performance. And yet he's got many simple facts wrong. So do regressions really provide evidence for reincarnation? The key to these regressions may have been discovered as long ago as 1906. Under hypnosis, a woman recalled intimate details of a past life as a medieval lady, Blanche Poinings, a close friend of Maud, Countess of Salisbury. However, the case was blown when she was rehypnotized and asked where she'd obtained the information. She answered, from a book, Countess Maud, by Emily Holt. And here it is. The closing pages are an historical appendix about Blanche Poinings, born before 1349. It turned out that she'd read this book many years before. And although she'd completely forgotten it, 
The facts had lodged themselves in her subconscious mind. Under hypnosis, not only did she recall the plot, she wrote herself into the script. This amazing ability of the human mind to remember, yet to forget that it is remembering, is called cryptomnesia. These secret memories, when triggered by hypnosis, can sometimes be so vivid that they're mistaken for reality. A remarkable case of cryptomnesia was shown by a Finnish teenager in the 1960s. Lisa spoke no English then, but when Dr. Reimer Kampmann regressed her, she described life as an innkeeper's daughter in medieval Norfolk and suddenly burst into song in English. But how had she learned an English song? Kampmann hypnotized her again and asked her. She said from a book, The Story of Music, she'd seen it in the library. One glance at this page and this old English song, foreign words, music and all, were imprinted on her mind. Since then, she has learned English and a distrust of hypnotic regression. I think it is nonsense. And uh, if we think these personalities, I have had many. It's not a question of reincarnation. It's just productive imagination. That's my opinion. We're all bombarded with masses of information from radio, TV, movies, books. People who claim to have lived past lives may have unconsciously absorbed the facts and stored them somewhere in the recesses of their minds. What these stories of reincarnation do prove is that our brains have a truly amazing ability to store huge blocks of information and to reproduce them with complete accuracy. This seems to me almost as amazing and as improbable as reincarnation itself. And just in case you do live again, you can be sure of an invitation to come as you were to the Los Angeles reincarnation party. Her Majesty, Queen Isabella of Spain. Whenever they can, the party guests try to dress up as the people they believe they once were. Talk, naturally, as of days gone by. Your rights are to do as the majority of the country dictates. No. We'll fight you for that, bad gum Yankee. Confederate scum. We have all day to enjoy it. Yeah. Some very fascinating people. That's <laughs> what about you? Uh, I am Escalapius. Which is say, Apollo's, yes, Apollo's mortal son. Oh, that's how I recognize you. Right. I was Kuan Yin in China, 4000 BC. I know this was my life. I was a simple woman as a temple healer, and I was killed by the Mongols, strung up, and I became a goddess because the people came back and saw what had happened. You know, I was, I was James Dean, my past life. I had deja vu experiences, and I asked a lot of other people who were psychics what that meant, and they said it must be a past life. Uh, so I went into some history books, and I just automatically went to the history of Spain, and I picked out the books of Isabella and Ferdinand, and, and as I glanced through those books, the things that I was remembering were written in history. It explains more to me than my Midwest upbringing ever did. I thoroughly believe in it. I feel that uh, many of the traits that I have today uh, are bearing direct bearings on what I did in past life. Oh, we go back all the way to Greece, ancient Greece, when Artie was a senator and I was his daughter. And, and if he's nice, that's fine. If he's not nice, that's fine. I have to be where he is. I find about 10% of my patients have brought some garbage with them from a past life. 
that does not respond to age regression in this life by taking the person all the way back to the womb, searching for the original episode, and they still have the emotional problem, then there's only one place to go to, and that's to a past life, and there I find it. Case history after case history. There is something to this. Next week, dowsing, an element of the divine.